Good morning, church. You made it back. Here we are, part four of five of this Created for Significance. I hope you've been enjoying this series. It's been powerful. It's been changing. I'm getting a lot of feedback on it. And by the way, do not miss this Wednesday. I got something for you. Ajax won't take off. It is going to be awesome. Okay, very powerful word. Heads up. Bring your notepads. Bring your steel toe boots and your dry erase board and a few other things. It's going to be awesome. Okay, so just just give you a little heads up. Today we go into a very interesting parable. In fact, just to make sure we're thinking, I want us to know the context, because context is everything. I can't stand it when people take God's word and twist it and make it say what they want it to say. Or they, they just say, oh, that's not exegesis, that's eisegesis. That's when you read into it what you think is there. Today, I'm, I, am, I make no bones about this. This is a difficult parable. A lot of pastors skip it, because it's similar to another parable in Matthew. But it's a parable that we have to understand, and it is so deep and so difficult. But once you extrapolate, you see what God's saying. It is amazing when you find out who Jesus is really talking to. See, up until now, Jesus has been talking to a certain segment of the populace in Luke 14 and Luke 15, but not today. So here's what I'm going to do. Don't say it, but I'm going to read out several names. See if you can crack the code of what they all have in common, okay? Some of you will get this, especially if you are at least mm, within my age bracket or maybe a little older. Are you ready? Not if you're with me. Emilio Estevez. C. Thomas Howell. <laughs> you, Louise has got it. Tom Cruise. Getting close. Don't say it yet. Hang on. Hold on. You guys are fired up, man. Rob Lowe. Matt Dillon. Let's see. Did I leave anybody else? Ralph Macchio. All right, all right. Does anybody know what they all have in common? The Outsiders, yes, these guys. Soda Pop and Pony Boy and Dairy and all these great guys. <laughs> Up until this moment in, the, in this, our study of Luke, this is who Jesus has been talking to. Not these guys, but outsiders. But here's the deal. These are a group of people who fancy themselves insiders. Devoutly religious people who are just misguided. Very proud, very arrogant sometimes. Maybe their heart was in the right place from time to time, but the Bible calls these people Pharisees, and they are the outsiders. See, Luke 14 and 15, we've been hitting all kinds of things, and Jesus is showing up. He's throwing these truth grenades on them, hoping that they will understand, guys, the love of the Father is different than what you are making it. It's not about onerous rules and regulations. It is about living a holy life. Make no mistake, as Christians, we are called not just a fluffy gospel, but to preach the whole counsel of God's word. It's love coupled with truth. And Jesus comes in, man, he's, he's disturbing the apple cart. They don't like this. And he's coming up. And you remember, we've talked about the, the great banquet, the parable of the lost sheep, parable of the lost coin. Last week was the parable of the lost son. And today we talk about the parable of the shrewd manager. This is where Jesus stops talking to these guys. And then he turns, and it's almost like he has a, a quiet huddle and says, come here, come here, disciples, come here, come here. I got a word just for you now. And he turns, and this is a, a big shift. He starts talking to the insiders, those who are committed, those who are diehard followers, so committed that this group of people has literally bet the farm that Jesus is who he says he is. He can do what he says he can do, and he represents who he says he represents. They have given everything. These disciples have left everything, literally, to follow him. So he's talking to these outsiders, and man, this is going to be one of the best rides, so buckle up. Go ahead and open your Bible if you haven't already. Luke 16, if you're reading from a digital Bible app, I'm going to read from the NLT today, okay? So if you want to follow along, and if you're following along online, God bless you. Great to have you with us. If you can't be here, that's the next best thing, and we're grateful to have you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do something I don't usually do. Because this is a difficult parable, I'm going to give you a 30-second overview of what we're about to read, and then we're going to read the whole thing. It is a lot of scripture, but that's where the power of God lies in his word. So here's what's happening. You're going to read about a rich guy. He's a nobleman. Jesus calls him a very wealthy nobleman, and he finds out that he's being cheated by one of his employees. How would you feel about that? So you've got this master, and he's got this manager, an employee who's been cheating people. But here's the thing. This guy, this cheater, does something very strange we might even call it borderline unethical, which is why this is such a bizarre parable. But in a shocking twist, the boss doesn't get mad at the guy. He doesn't berate him. He doesn't, he doesn't even demand repayment. He lets him go. But he's very, and then he comes back, and he praises 
the shrewdness of this rascal who's cooking the books. It is so bizarre. How's that for a twist? All right? So now that you're kind of into the zone, look with me. Luke 16, starting in verse 1. Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you are going to be fired. The manager thought to himself, well, now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have strength to dig ditches. I'm way too proud to beg. Isn't that a song? No. And he says, ah. I know, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home <laughs> when I'm fired. So he invited each person in who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? The man replied, uh, 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager told him, mm -mm, take your bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. Can you imagine this guy? His eyes get wide. He's not done. Verse 7, he says, hey, how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. I owe him a 1,000 bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, take your bill and change it to 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it's true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than the children of the light. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then... When your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Verse 10, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in the little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should anyone trust you with things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for he will hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. I love this. Verse 14, the Pharisees, who dearly loved their money, heard all this and scoffed at him. I love, look what Jesus does, man. This is, this is such a gentle spanking. He just looks at him and says, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. And what this world honors, it's detestable in the sight of God. And I bet you could hear a pin drop, <laughs> kind of like right now. It is so powerful. Do you see why this has confounded people for years and years? Because we don't understand the mid, Middle East mindset and how it, it is so different than America's mindset. 2,000 years later, and everybody comes up with theories and, and reasons of how this is different and why he might do this and what's wrong with this story, but I promise all of them miss the mark unless you know something about the Middle Eastern culture and the historical context here. So in just a few minutes, when we leave here, you are all going to be experts at this. You're going to walk out of here. You, you're going to be a Pharisee. <laughs> you're going to feel slightly superior to everybody because you know more, all right? It's going to be one of those great times. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to break this down into four scenes. Last week, we broke it down into five. Today, we break it down into four scenes, the story of the shrewd manager. Scene number one is in the master's office. This is where the scene unfolds, where this rascal, this scoundrelly guy gets word that he has been laid off, downsized, kicked out, fired, you name it. Then we move to scene two, which is on the way to get the books. This is an important scene because this is where he gets to do some fast thinking, and some quick creative thinking goes on, and he starts hatching a plan. And he realizes, uh-oh, my boss is not playing around here, which leads us to the climax in scene three, which is with the books. This is where the manager works the plan that he hatched on the way to get his books, and the plan works apparently flawlessly. And it's such a bizarre plan, which leads us to scene four, back in the master's office again, and this is where the tension and everything explodes and the resolution happens. So let's walk through each one of these. Scene one, we're in the master's office, and there's three characters that are being introduced to us. Two of them are in the room, but a third one is only hinted at. The first one, obviously, is the main character, and that is the master. This is the wealthy Middle Eastern landowner. Jesus calls him a rich man. And it's obvious that people respect this guy. You know how you can tell? Because all the peasants, all the landowners, all the sharecroppers, don't go to the manager. They go around the manager to the master and say, hey, man, your little regional manager, he's, 
He's cooking the books. You know, he's cheating. He's squeezing us, and he's doing... Did you, did you know that? So they obviously liked him and respected him enough to go around. Jesus' exact words in verse 2, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So the master calls him in and very calmly, very graciously, this is better than what a lot of us would do, he doesn't scold him or berate him or threaten him. He doesn't even demand repayment. That shows such incredible patience and restraint. Okay, so that's, that's the first character. The second one also starts with an M, and that's the manager. Now, this is, I don't know about you, but when I hear the word manager, maybe you think of like um, a well-buttoned-up guy who's got it all together, someone you love to be with, a great party guy, and all these, I don't know, but anytime I hear the word manager, I can't help it, I always picture this guy right here. (laughs) Is it just me? Assistant, no, not assistant to the regional manager. He's even lower. So this is who I picture, right? But this guy's not respected. In fact, he's not even a good manager, according to scriptures. He's mismanaging the money. He is cooking the books for his own gain, and nobody likes this guy. And he's trying to build up his own advantage, and he's so rascally, you might even call him a scoundrel. In fact, instead of that picture, we should probably put up this picture, because this is who I picture more in my mind. Han Solo, the scoundrel. And he knows he's a scoundrel. And everybody, even Princess Leia, knows he's a scoundrel. The Hebrew word used here is shalua. It's a beautiful word. This is somebody who's hired to be an administrator. The Greek word you might recognize is oikonomos. Sounds very familiar to our word economist. Okay? So he's an educated man. He's trained. He knows things. And what happens is, just like the Ottoman Turks back in the 1500s, when they conquered this land, they showed up, they took everybody's land, And then they divided it back amongst some leaders, some loyal people, and then they rented it back to the people they just stole it from on the condition that they would give a percentage of the crops back to them. I want some of your wheat, I want some of your oil and your olives and things like that, okay? So it was a very unfair thing. And those peasants resented that, wouldn't you? This hits close to home. When I was a young little nard growing up in Titusville, Florida, I had two older brothers. I want to show you this. This is right here. This is, this is my older brother, Jeff. This is, this is my middle brother, Tim. And this handsome head of hair is your pastor with apparently shop glasses on. <laughs> One day, me and my older brother are walking through the hallway, and the door is closed to Tim's bedroom. Boy, I hope my brother's watching. <laughs> I knock on the door, and he goes, just a minute. We'll be ready in five minutes. What? Be ready for what? Do, 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 do. I said, just a minute, the store is going to be open in three minutes. Whoa, whoa, the store. Let me, I want to come in. He opens the door and he goes, I promise, it'll be worth your while. Go get Jeff and go get your money. Shuts the door. I'm like, sweet, we got a store going on in here. So I go get my older brother and he's like, what? And I said, I don't know what's going on, but I walked through and he said, the store will be open in two minutes. So we're standing at the door. We're so excited. We can't wait. And finally, Tim comes and he opens the door with a flourish. And there on his bed, which is made, which is a miracle, and it's everything is laid out, these incredible toys, like Millennium Falcons, and there's comic books, and there's my my older brother's Molly Hatchet and Air Supply albums, and I mean, all these things. There's like a Batman hairbrush that I just, I used to love. And I'm looking around, I'm like, this is, and I go and I look at the prices, and it's like 25 cents for Castle Grayskull. What? That's fantastic. This is an original Superman comic book, and you want a dollar ten? Man, these are fantastic deals. I look at my older brother, he's like, man, these are great deals. It's, I used to have one just like. <laughs> Isn't that your Millennium Falcon, Matt? And, hey, wait a minute. These are all my toys. These are all Jeff's comic books and records. <laughs> this is how shrewd he is. Without missing a beat, he says, I know. And they can be yours for this bargain price, (laughs) right? Right? Wait for it. We went back to our room and got more money. (laughs) It came back like, man, this is a good deal. We got to do this. This is such a good deal. And I'm buying my own toys for my own brother a second time. (laughs) Now, how shrewd of a manager is that? I saw this happen in real, I mean, he's so shrewd. I can't believe it. So this is how these peasant farmers felt. You know, years later, I I had to confess, I resent my brother from selling my own stuff back to me. You know, I'm not bitter. I'm over it, I think. But this is is what we picture here. These 
guys, this, this manager is squeezing the peasants, not only for the master's gain, but for his own personal gain, okay? So which brings us to the third group that's in this scene but is not mentioned, and that's these peasants. That's these sharecroppers, these farmers here, who they've negotiated with the wascally manager what percentage every year they have to give up their own crop, their own hard work, just to live on their own land. You see how this works? So it's these peasants who have blown the whistle on this guy, and they've shortchanged him. They went over his head to the master and said, your dude is cheating you, which sets up the tension. This is the conflict. So the master calls the manager into his office, and he says a beautiful question. He says, what's this I hear about you? Now, Jesus is very particular about the words he uses here. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, hey, I hear you've been cheating me. He doesn't come out. He doesn't put him on the defensive. It's a very open-ended question. He's not tipping his hand as to what he knows. He says, hey, what's this I hear about you? And he's very, very smart with this. Now, <laughs> the manager doesn't know what to say. How much does his boss know? He doesn't want to say anything more, so he stays silent. Is he, did, did he know just about one thing, two events? What all does he know? I want to hear what he has to say. Well, neither of them are saying much. So the manager goes on, or the master goes on, he delivers his second sentence. He says, get your report in order. That means get the books because you are no longer going to be my manager. Translation, in the words of the great Ron Burgundy, beep, boop, boop, you're fired. This is what he's saying. He says, you're fired. Now, remember, back then, they, <laughs> they didn't have severance. When like 60 days, go find you another job. I'll try to write you a nice little letter. Are you okay, you little snowflake? Do I need to hold your hand on this? Do I need to go, you going to mom's basement, going to play on your Commodore 64 again? What are we doing? He says, get your books, bring them back. You're fired. You're done. But he doesn't yell. He doesn't go crazy on them. He doesn't put them in jail. He could have. The Mishnah tells you that he could have. The Jewish commentary in the Old Testament says, man, he could have been thrown in jail. He could have demanded repayment until the last cent was repaid back. He doesn't do any of that which is so, so strange to me. So here's what happens. Notice this guy doesn't say any defense. He's quiet. This shrewd manager, now it's almost as if he realizes from here on out, everyone knows I'm guilty. So all of my energy is going to be focused on what do I do now? What do I do with my future? What am I going to do? He can't believe it. He's leaving his, pet, his manager's office, and I can imagine as the door closes, I can't believe I'm a free man. I can't believe he hasn't thrown me in jail. If he really knows what I've done, this guy... You know what, this guy, he didn't even scold me. It's almost like he's merciful, like he's generous, like he's compassionate. So he's thinking, he's wrestling all these things, and he's going to get the books, which brings us to scene two. Luke 16, two says, go get your report in order. That's what a bookkeeper does. That's what managers do. How do they account for their work? They have balance sheets, and they balance the books. In fact, old bookkeepers never die. They just lose their balance. Sorry, I had to, I had to. I saw that this week. I said, that's so going in my sermon. <laughs> so in the Middle East, you have to understand, there is, there is no severance. He has to get the books. This is, he's fired, but this is his last job. So he goes and he gets the books, and on his way, he's thinking furiously. And Luke 16, 3 tells us, my master is taking my job. What do I do? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm way too proud to beg. And so he's walking, and his head's spinning, and I'm thinking he's going through all these things. I've manipulated my boss's money for years. Everyone knows it. No one's going to hire me because nobody likes me. My reputation is mud. Nobody wants to be around me. And then he starts thinking, I have it. I have a plan. It's genius. I'm not going to stake my future on my reputation. I'm going to stake my future on my master's reputation. Oh, this is going somewhere, church. This is the man who was kind. After all, he didn't reprimand me. He didn't spank me. He didn't throw me out in public humiliation. He didn't even demand repayment. He said, Get your books together. You're done. I'm going to trust in the master's mercy. Which brings us to scene three. Now he's back with the books. Scene three reveals this beautiful plan that he's hatched. And ironically, I love it. This plan has everything to do with the master and nothing to do with the manager. Don't miss that. Now the manager has to move fast. He has a limited window. And if you were a movie guy, this is where you would cue the theme music of Mission Impossible. So he comes back in there, and I could see him. And he says, all right, steward, I need you to go call in all of my master's tenants. Everyone who owes him money, go get them now. Because he has a limited window. Guess why? They don't know he's been fired. Think about that. He has a limited amount. 
This plan will only work if they realize he still has some perception of authority. If they find out he has no authority, this entire scam collapses. So he calls them in quickly, and he's working for the master, and he, this is what they think. They think, okay, well, you know what? The peasants don't know he's been fired yet, so they get this summons, and they show up assuming he still works there, assuming he still has a sanctioned from the master pull to call them off the streets. So as soon as the first tenant farmer shows up, this is where it gets real. He pulls out his contract, and he says in verse 5, quick, how much do you owe my master? And I can see him nervously looking around. And the guy looks, he says, I owe 800 gallons of olive oil. And the manager says this, he says, no, take your bill and quickly, notice the word, it says quickly. He knows he's got to move fast. Quickly, change it to 400. Are you serious? Okay, thank you. He calls the next one and he says, hey, quick, how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat. Not anymore. Today is your lucky day. Today you owe 800. And he's working fast because he knows if someone comes in and pokes his head in the door and says, hey, I heard you've been fired. This whole thing is done and it's over. The manager is shrewd and he's lightning fast and he pulls it off. One by one, the tenants come in and they all have their bills reduced. This is him betting the farm on his master's reputation. If he truly is generous and merciful, he's going to be okay. But if he's not, this poor guy is going to be singing the Hebrew Folsom Prison Blues with Johnny Cash in a matter of minutes. It is over. Everything has been staked on his master's reputation. Now, let me ask you something. How rare is it that a landlord comes and says, you know what, I've been thinking about your rent, and I'm just going to cut it in half because I'm a nice guy. Has anyone ever had that happen? I think I'm just going to tell you, well, really? That's fantastic. I want his number. That is so rare. It's almost unheard of. And think about this. Let me put this in modern day terms. Let's say I'm a, I'm a car salesman and imagine getting, me, uh, getting a call from me and I just sold you your last car maybe a year ago. And you pick up the phone and I say, hey, have you gotten your check yet? And what check? Why, the check from the dealership, of course. Yeah, oh, there's a $5,000 rebate coming your way yeah, for no particular reason. I'm just a nice guy and, well, people listen to me. Can you imagine getting that call? If that who's your new best friend? This guy? I would be your new best friend. That's what's happened. As quickly as the manager can, he gathers up these freshly reduced contracts, and he races back to the master's office. And that's where scene four happens. We're back in the master's office, and there he is. And the manager looks down, and the master looks down, and they see these, the ink is still wet on these contracts. The master knows what's going on. He's not a dummy. We, we know this by the way he's talked about. And I'm sure not only can he see the evidence, but I bet he can hear it too. I bet there's people out in the, in the, in the streets, all these tenants going, woo hoo hoo hip hip hooray, who's got the greatest manager ever? This guy just for doing, they're dancing and they're having fun and everybody's going nuts and they're like, hip hip hooray, hip hip hooray. And the master's hearing this and he's seeing the contract and he says, oh, you got to be kidding. You are shrewd. Shrewd move. Bravo, shrewd, you are a rascal. In fact, you are so wise of a rascal, you are a scoundrel. And that's where this scene takes a big turn. He does the unthinkable. There's no jail sentence, there's nothing. Why? Because this manager has appealed to the mercy and the generosity and the faithfulness of the one who outranks him. This is so deep. Y'all, in the Middle East, there is a story that they tell to this day about this very thing. When Saladin, the sultan, was throwing a guy, a condemned murderer, into jail, soon to be executed, this killer on death row kept crying out from his jail cell, I want to see the sultan. I demand to see the sultan. Take me to see the sultan. And finally, after wearing them down, they bring him before the sultan. And he looks, and this is what he says. Here is the actual quote. O oh, most gracious sultan, my sins are great, but the mercy of the sultan is greater. And guess what the sultan did? He let him go. He let him go because he appealed to his pride here. Remember, in the Middle Eastern mindset, saving face, protecting your reputation is everything. This is such a key point. Don't miss it. The Bible says a good name is more desirable than great riches. It's to be esteemed better than silver and gold. And Middle Easterners believe this. This is a, this is a 
proof positive right here that the master in this story is generous and he's merciful. And Jesus is telling us, guys, the shrewd move is to trust in the master. The shrewd move is to bet the farm that he is generous, that he is faithful and merciful. The question that he's raising, remember, he's talking to the insiders now. What he's raising in this parable is this. What are you going to do with the one asset you have? This this is where the rubber meets the road now. (laughs) What are you going to do with the one asset you have? A wise and shrewd person uses his assets, everything he has, to bless others and gain a lasting future for himself. Look what Jesus says, verse 9. He says, here's your lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Translation, you have one life. Use it wisely. Bless others. Enhance your future. Use it to build friendships with people who could say to you someday in heaven, thank you, thank you, thank you. I am here because of you. Thank, I am here because of your faithfulness. Thank you. Where moss can't come in and, and eat it, where thieves can't steal, where rust doesn't come and corrupt, we have heaped up these things. This is what, if you really want to go deep, talk about leaving a legacy for God, listen to what David Jeremiah said in, in his study Bible. He says, How people handle their money, their assets, is a great indicator of their heart condition. And in part, determines what kind of assets and responsibilities the Lord will entrust to them, both in this age and the age to come. We haven't even talked about the millennial reign, or Jesus coming back and making a new heavens and a new earth, and how we will reign with him, and how he even says we will judge angels. I mean, it is incredible what waits for us, for those who are faithful servants. This is incredible. He's saying... When God provides everything you have, and we use it only to enrich ourselves, this shows we are untrustworthy of more. But the opposite is true. If you are wise and generous and faithful with everything he gives you, this yields a greater future for us. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Man, that is powerful. Church, that verse can change your life. Are you lacking significance? Are you lacking purpose? Try living for someone other than yourself. It changes everything. It makes us ask the question, what do I do with what's been entrusted to me? And here's your answer. Invest it in making friends for eternity. So let me ask you, how are you doing with that? As your friendly neighborhood pastor, just me and you, you're safe here. It's the potter's hand. That's the beautiful thing. We can take down our masks. We don't have to pretend we got it all together. Ain't nobody here got it all together, right? Nod if you're with me. No? Okay, the rest of you are lying. You are lying. <laughs> when we use our time to glorify God, when we use our, our talents to glorify God, when we use our treasure to advance his kingdom and glorify God, I like to think of us imagining the new Christ followers that will come up to us on the streets of glory and say, thank you. I am here today because this is incredible. You opened your friendship to me. You opened your church to me. You helped lead me to my relationship with the king. I am here today because of you. And I imagine hundreds of us in glory, in the Lord's presence, hugging and high-fiving and saying, yes, you're here. You made it. Who'd you bring with you? Who did you bring? Your whole family is here? It's even better than we thought it was going to be. This is amazing. And thank you. Thank you. My eternity has changed because of you. And that is a vision we're focusing on. That is what the church is about. The ultimate vision up in heaven, us celebrating together for eternity because we did our best to win friends for eternity. And I love how the master responds. Don't miss that. It's so bizarre. He says, shrewd move. Shrewd move. (laughs) Bravo. I love that. Jesus isn't done. He's got another lesson. Look at verse 10. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. But if you're dishonest with little, you'll be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, how in the world will you be trusted with eternal riches, with true riches? If you haven't been trustworthy with someone else's property, I'm not going to give you property of your own. You don't deserve that. I think it's like Jesus' way of asking, look, do you want a big kingdom assignment, both here and in glory, or do you want a small one? It's very powerful. Verses 10 through 13 are asking us this question. What do I want entrusted to me? And then the answer is very clear. The better I invest what I have, the more will be entrusted to me. 
So how do you feel about that? Because Jesus isn't done. There's one more final lesson. He says, no servant can serve two masters. He'll either hate one and love the other, or he'll be faithful to one and despise the other, because you just can't serve both God and mammon is the actual word, things of this world, money, stuff. And this verse asked the question, well, can I, can I split my loyalty? Can I split my, the way I invest my life in two places? Can I work on my little stockpile over here? My precious, don't touch. And then over here I go and I work on God's stockpile, and we have a good time over here, his precious. Can I divide my loyalty? Can I do that? Can I straddle the fence? Can I have one foot in both and just maybe have the best of both worlds? And Jesus says, no. <laughs> no, you can't. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't ride the fence. You can't have it both ways. You can't serve two masters. I debated whether I want to share a very personal letter. In fact, I think we're going to do it. We're going to end a little different. Jason, if you'll come up, we'll just go ahead. and I'm going to make a transition, and I want to share something with you, a very real true life story that happened to me and unbeknownst to you it happened to you and this isn't one of those sermon illustrations from the great beyond this happened to potter's hand one month ago a very powerful very real thing and, and i'm going to keep this very uh anonymous because i didn't have a chance to ask permission if i could share this so i'm going to withhold all names so uh if you're here in this room uh no one will know it's you unless you react okay <laughs> so just kind of keep it one of the joys of being a pastor is hearing and seeing selfless, beautiful generosity in ministry that happens behind the scenes. And it's awesome. Somebody come up and says, I want to bless that family. Can I do that? Absolutely. But I don't want them to know it's me. Got you covered. I want to bless this person. Or can we, can we pay for this? Or can we do that? Can, I'm praying for this. I want to treat them to this. And it is so, so awesome. Now, when there's an unusual or a new account activity online, if they use the kiosk or they give something on a website, PayPal will send an alert to us so that we're aware of that. This is my response to just such an act. Dear so-and-so, see, I withheld the name. I don't usually do this. In fact, I've never done this. I just had to stop and thank you personally for what you did this week, for your offering. You could not have done this. There's no way. There's no way. But your amazing generosity was an answer to prayer and came at a critical time. See, at the end of the year, if you're a growing church especially, it's lean because you're always behind the curve. And we've done some big things this year, huge steps of faith that if I had hair, I would have lost it because I'm stepping out in very uncomfortable waters, doing bigger and badder things for, for the kingdom and not being content to just, God bless us for no more, shut the door. But to stretch and say, there is a lost and dying world that needs it. And so it was critical and it was lean. And, and, and you know, Christmas nonprofits that time, people are spending stuff everywhere else and stuff and nonprofits and ministries, they, they sometimes get forgotten about. So every December is tough. And this person had no idea what we were looking at. So I continue, I say this. <clears throat> I'll be happy to share the whole story of, of all that's happened if you want to hear it, but for now, I just want to say this. On behalf of a grateful church, please accept my heartfelt thanks and my gratitude. As you know, we're not a mega church by any means, and uh, your offering was among the largest single offerings we have ever received in the 16 years history of our church. It could not have come at a better time. Just ask Linda, y'all. She knows it was almost exactly what we needed to make it through to January. There's no way this person could have known that. No way. So I conclude my letter with this because this was not an accident. This was a God-ordained thing where he moved in the heart of someone who was faithful and they responded to a God who has shown himself faithful. And it is so powerful. And I said, listen, I just want to say your generosity will allow us to keep moving forward to meet the needs of so many this time of year. So thank you again. And I'm asking God to bless you for your faithfulness and for your generosity. Sincerely, Pastor Matt. I didn't think anything of it. I sent it off. A few days later, I get a reply. I get a reply. So simple, so beautiful, so humble, so short. The person basically and simply said this. Please don't thank me. 
Isn't that great? Please don't thank me. Because we are just working to meet what God requires. We are just working to meet the tithe commitment God expects of us. That aside, this person goes on to say, I am so glad to hear that this offering was an answered prayer. And I'm glad that I was able to help God's church in some way. Friends, that is somebody who has determined which master he will serve. That is somebody who has determined to serve one master over the other. Don't thank me. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to have been doing all along, being faithful. Almost 16 years ago, to this day, two couples, a little broken, a little bruised, slunked away to a borrowed condominium on the coast to pray, to heal, and to dream. And those couples came and we bet the farm, not on what we knew, but on what we knew of our master, on what his reputation does. He has never let us down, and it has been the ride of a lifetime. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to invite every one of us, right where you are, we don't have to come down forward, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to be done. I want to invite each one, if you are on the fence today, if you feel like maybe you've got one foot in the world and one foot, and you're not being like a sold-out disciple of Christ, I'm going to invite you to make your decision. Right where you are in your chair, who's your master? With the time he's given you, with the heartbeat, with the assets, with the resources, with the talents he's given you, who is your master? Who do you serve this day? I want to invite you to hop down off the fence and bet the farm on the master because he's faithful and he's generous and he's good. Each week during the series, I've given you a challenge to send you out with. The first week, it was a short prayer to pray. If you don't remember, I'll remind us. It says, God, I'm sorry for living like a Pharisee. I don't want to live like that. I don't know what you want me to do, but I know I want you to change me. It's a powerful but simple prayer. The second and third week, we prayed this. God, I'm not here to ask you for much today. I just ask that you give me your heart for lost people. Mm. That's a powerful prayer. Today, I have one more. This is your challenge. If you're a note taker, this is what you write down. I want you to pray this prayer before you leave. How do you, Lord, want me to invest my one and only life? And then be obedient. That's your challenge. See, what's going to happen is in two minutes, we're going to all walk out that door, and we're going to re-enter a chaotic and a loud and a crazy world. It's going to be tested. We're going to walk out that door, but before we do that, we're going to pause and we're going to have a heart-to-heart conversation with the Lord. Right where you are, just make it. In fact, go ahead and bow now. Just close your eyes and just kneel before the master and make that an altar right there in your chair. Thank him for who he is and then ask him, what decision, Lord, do you want me to make? And Just be obedient. That's all he's asking. How do you, Lord, want us to invest our one and only life that you've given us? Father, we thank you that you are generous and that you are merciful and you are faithful. I thank you that we can trust you. God, before we leave this week, I pray you would help us. Instead of serving all those things that the American dream says we're supposed to pursue and lust after, oh, Father, forgive us and help us to understand what it means to invest our one and only life, welcoming people into eternity. Use us, Lord. Everything we have is from you. Every breath we have. Every talent you've given us, every gift is from you. So, Lord, we publicly thank you here and now for everything you've done. And God, as a pastor, I thank you for all those who have invested everything to advance your kingdom. Thank you for reminding us today of your generosity, of your mercy for us. Thank you for being a God who didn't scold us or reprimand us. You didn't even demand repayment for our sin. Even though we are scoundrels, even though we have blown it, God, I thank you that you are a God who comes through again and again every time we bet the farm on you because you are good and you are faithful and you are true. So, Lord, as we leave this place, Lord, would you give us boldness to follow you this week, to be different, 
to be called out as disciples, as followers of you who are radically saved, who aren't ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. We thank you for that, and we anticipate the divine appointments you'll give us. We love you. We confess our dependence on you every day. And we thank you for meeting with us during this hour. In Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. You are dismissed. I hope you have an awesome week. Have a great time. I will see you Wednesday night.